Hey guys, welcome to the Digital Storytelling for Social Impact course. We will be getting started shortly. You're on today with me, Rob Wu, CEO of Coswox, and also Jeremy Bivens. Jeremy, why don't you introduce yourself real fast? All right. Uh, hi, everybody. I'm Jeremy. I'm the Managing Director of Good Dog Strategies. Yeah, Jeremy will be our instructor today for Digital Story for Social Impact, and he'll tell you a lot more about himself once we get started. So a few housekeeping items um, to start. You should be able to hear me clearly right now. If you don't, then feel free to chat me in. There's also a chat box on this interface where if you have any questions at any time, uh, whether it's a question related to logistics or about the technical side or even the content itself, very importantly, then feel free to chat it in. Um, we'll be happy to help uh, resolve any of those questions. At the end of the class today, we'll have a time, plenty of time for some one-on-one -on -one Q and A. So feel free to chat in those questions or type it into the Q and A box, and I'll be sure to line those up, tee those up for Jeremy once the class concludes, so we can get those answered for you in real time. Uh, we will be getting started in about just one minute. So feel free to buckle down, get some coffee, get a drink of water. Uh, whatever you need, we're excited to kick, it, to kick this class forward. Hey, Jeremy, can you share your screen? Yep. Sorry, one second. All right, let's get started. So everybody, welcome to the Digital Storytelling for Social Impact course. We're super excited to have you join us today for this course. Um, my name is Rob Wu. I'm the CEO of Cosmox. Super excited to have all of you learn about digital storytelling and how you can further that for your nonprofit and organization. You're also on with Jeremy Bivens. Um, Jeremy is the managing director of Good Dog Strategies. He's been a friend of Cosmox for maybe a whole decade, maybe longer. I have no <laughs> idea. Um, but I worked closely hand in hand with Jeremy at the Rockefeller Foundation. Um, we worked together on a storytelling initiative a few years ago uh, that was amazing. We also worked recently uh, a few years ago on a Giving Tuesday initiative and training and capacity building. And when we were putting together this course, we thought about you know what kind of topics nonprofits that we talk to that come to us, what kind of topics they will want to learn about. And one of the key ones really was around storytelling because of the, the, the profound impact that it can have on an organization as well as the social impact. Uh, Jeremy, do you want to talk a little bit about Good Dog Strategies? Yeah, sure. So uh, just quickly, um, I've been a digital strategist for a little over 10 years now. Um, and Good Dog Strategies was founded about a year ago. Uh, we work with nonprofits, social enterprise, foundations, anybody who's doing good in the world to help them tell their story uh, and communicate their impact to the world. Yeah. And at Cosvox, uh, as you may know, you know, we are a digital fundraising platform for nonprofits. You can raise more with less effort with Cosvox. Essentially, our mission is to de clunkify all of the clunky complex and contract bound software that you use and actually have something that helps you acquire donors more easily and faster than before. So you can run donation pages that have a digital marketing focus. You can run crowdfunding, you can run peer to peer fundraising all in one roof at Cosvox. In terms of today's course, uh, our digital storytelling course, I just want to give you an overview so you know what you're getting yourself into. Today is class one. Uh, this is March 12th, 3 p.m. right now. Uh, we're going to talk about content and capacity when it comes to storytelling. Class two is scheduled for Tuesday next week on March 17th at 3 p.m. Eastern. 
uh, what they're going to talk about marketing and measurements when it comes to digital storytelling. And then very lastly, class three, uh, which is less of a class and more of a one-on-one -on -one session. These are individually scheduled. So you have a storytelling coach uh, that you get to talk to, to help, to help optimize your storytelling plans. This coach is going to be Jeremy Bivens. So <laughs> you are going to hear from the, the true source himself. And so be sure to have your questions, have your plans ready uh, so that you can take advantage of this storytelling coaching session. At the end of class two, you'll receive a summary email from me um, with a link to schedule your time. So look out for that at the end of class two. And on, at the end of class one, which is today, uh, you'll receive an email with the recordings as well as all the slides to the class today. So look out for that very soon. In addition for this course, uh, in addition to receiving the live access right now, as well as the recordings, you also have access to a digital storytelling framework that Jeremy created himself. I looked over this the other day, it's amazing. It helps you go through on how to structure your content in your blog posts so that you get the most amount of impact. And Jeremy will go over that at the end of the course. Uh, and very lastly, uh, you also get access to the Coswox basic plan. The basic plan is just a free plan at Coswox. Uh, there's no monthly fee, no annual fee, no platform fee. The only thing you pay is the credit card processing fee. So this is as cheap as it gets. If you need a platform to help you with digital storytelling, um, when it's when tied to fundraising, then feel free to check out the Coswox basic plan. At this time, we have about 45 minutes uh, for this online course. And at the end, we wanna make sure we save up enough time for some questions. So again, make sure, type those in, into the chat. Um, let us know what questions you have when it comes to digital storytelling. To kind of warm us up, and as, we, as I transition this to Jeremy, you know, let us know who you are, uh, what's your name, what organization you're with, for free to chat that in. We'd love to see kind of who we're talking to at, over the course of this course. So without further ado, I'll hand it over to you, Jeremy. Thanks, Rob. Um, so because we have about 45 minutes, I'm going to try to cover everything in this slide deck, but rest assured that anything we don't cover, I'll either move into the second class uh, or you know, you'll get a copy of this deck as well so we can kind of go over anything that you also might have questions on that we don't get to. So let's just kick it off with the basics. So what is a story? Uh, a story is an account of imaginary or real people and events told for entertainment, or in our case, for impact. When you're looking for impact stories, there's no better place to turn than the social sector for those stories. But no matter the, social, no matter the sector, social, for-profit, wherever, all stories tend to have a few things in common. Stories are captivating, they're entertaining, they're inspiring, they're educating. They can spur us to take action. Stories activate parts of our brain that otherwise lay dormant while reading or listening to a presentation. Hearing a story puts more of our brain to work than just by listening to somebody, somebody present or talk about facts to us. So when we think about the history of storytelling, obviously this wasn't just founded in the 20th century or the 19th or 18th. And we thousands and thousands of years of stories across the world. So in 1949, a literature professor named Joseph Campbell published a book. It's called The Hero with a Thousand Faces. In that book, he explores the similarities from the myths and the legends in human history. And he called this theory the monomyth concept or one myth, which sees all narratives as basic variations on a single theme. Campbell based this idea on patterns that he observed while studying the myths and fables from around the world from each of these uh, corners of the planet. The central pattern that he observed is represented in this graphic here. It's what he called the hero's journey. This is a graphic from Campbell. If you follow uh, the arrows on the hero's journey, you notice that the path starts with our hero. The hero is called to an adventure where they then receive some or often supernatural aid, which pushes them across some sort of threshold. They recruit friends and a mentor who enhance and aid our hero along their journey. And then our hero reaches a crossroad, a turning point, a grand challenge that they must overcome before they can get to the next step. In overcoming that challenge, our hero is then transformed into something and someone better than they were before. And because of that transformation, they're able to reconcile that challenge and life moves on. So 
my version of this and this graphic is a very oversimplified version of the hero's journey uh, to really kind of get this idea across. So where do we see this concept manifest if you think about stories from yesteryear all the way to today? We literally see it everywhere. There's a reason why we go to movies, watch TV, read books, and almost predictably say, this story is so overdone, or the new Star Wars is basically a remake of the old one. If you think about Star Wars, the story is of a young man who's frustrated by the rule of an evil empire, wishes he could do more about it. So he meets an old hermit who turns out to be a Jedi master. There's those supernatural powers. After his aunt and uncle are killed by the empire, he's called to become a Jedi himself. So he teams up with a band of rebels, fights the empire, confronts his own inner demons, and then he ultimately wins the day with the help of his friends. And this one I, I admit is slightly cheating because George Lucas said that Joseph Campbell influenced the design of the Star Wars saga. So if science fiction isn't your jam, what about fantasy? There's no cheating on this one. This one's all Tolkien. We consistently see the same setup for story arcs, no matter the genre, no matter the time, the period, no matter the storyteller. There's a winning formula here that doesn't just have to win Emmys. What if we could use stories to win hearts and minds instead? So if you're here today, you already support the idea that storytelling is a compelling tool for inspiring action. Uh, and also for influencing thought leaders and decision makers. In the digital world, the shape and delivery of stories has shifted dramatically. Traditional long form articles now share the stage with tweets and messages of 280 characters, images that disappear in seconds after they're opened. And while there's never been more ways to reach audiences, it's never been more difficult to truly reach them to actually get people's attention. So when you're crafting stories, real stories, you need a strategic approach to cut through all the noise. And for that, your stories really have to stand out. So in any successful engagement strategy, quality stories are at the heart of it. I'm a believer that the social impact sector is better positioned than any other to use stories to really connect with an audience. And the reason social good stories matter is because they're honest, they're hopeful, brutal, funny, scary, and they're more human than most other sectors can dream up. We have the ability to shift the dynamics in the social sector by bringing the right people and the right resources together. And that's why strategic storytelling is important to combine the tools and resources we need to tell meaningful stories. Stories of purpose don't just materialize. They're strategically planned, they're creatively crafted, and they're designed to achieve measurable outcomes. So if we take our hero's journey wheel and apply it to the social impact space, to social impact stories we wanna design, we get this social impact story map. Number one, we have the status quo and first steps. Two, we have our obstacles and allies. Three, we have our breakthrough. And four, we have our impact and our call to action. And you can see why it's very similar to Campbell's idea, but it's boiled down and really just kind of focused on the essence of what we really need as a, as a sector. So I used to have this pinned to my cubicle wall when I was still working in house at a foundation. Every time someone submit a blog post or would even send a photo or a short Facebook or Instagram post, you could glance up at this wheel, make sure that they'd sent me all the necessary components for a compelling piece. And that's not to say that you have to be a slave to the wheel, that everything you receive must follow it step by step, but you should be able to match up at least three out of the four uh, for nearly every piece of content to give the reader or listener or viewer some context about what it is you're posting. So if you think about a social media post, you might not think you need all those components for a photo for Instagram, but what message would your photo convey if you really didn't tee up what was going on in the photo? Who are we looking at? What are they doing? And maybe what next step should the person take after they view it? Take, for example, Humans of New York. Uh, it's, if you're not familiar, it's a photo storytelling site known for beautiful photographs married to short blurbs or quotes uh, from each of the subjects. I always like to point this, to this example because Humans of New York is all about the short stories that you can tell through photos, not through long form, which is what most people think of when you talk about storytelling. So in 2012, Superstorm Sandy devastated New York and New Jersey. They left hundreds of thousands of people homeless and without power. Uh, and there's a phenomenal HuffPo quote from November of that year, which I really think captures the duality of life for many of us at the time who lived in the city. So here it goes. When Sandy hit New York City, it completely destroyed some neighborhoods just as completely as it spared others. While Breezy Point was underwater and on fire, the Upper East Side could still watch Netflix. So if you are from New York City, you lived here during the time, you can appreciate what life was like on the ground. I remember in my neighborhood, a bunch of trees had gone down. I was out in Queens at the time, cars were crushed, 
there were some houses without power. Thankfully, my building didn't lose power. And then coming into the city felt like going to a different world. I had friends who couldn't charge their phones at home. And so they had moved uh, up above 14th Street were essentially you know, refugees with backpacks living from couch to couch from who, would, who would be there. So seeing this happening on the ground, Brandon Stanton, the photographer at that time who just launched the photo-driven storytelling platform, Humans of New York, he decided to share those stories of individuals coming together in the aftermath of Sandy. He wanted to show all sides of the story, not just the victims, but also the first responders, the volunteers, and the community that was helping them to recover. In Stanton's words, Hurricane Sandy revealed the power of nature as well as the power of humanity. We aim to document both. Through his crowdfunding campaign, fueled by photos and stories supporting the greater narrative of community resilience, Tumblr, uh, a social network from yesteryear at this point, and Humans of New York beat their goal of $100,000 by raising nearly $320,000 over a 10-day period in November of 2012. So why was this campaign so effective? Because Stanton's stories put a human face on the tragic aftermath of the storm and the incredible and heartwarming outpouring of support for people who lost their homes. By putting first responders and volunteers in his photos, he laid the foundations for a highly motivating uh, storytelling campaign because people are motivated to support a cause when they can relate to the need, but also when they understand the solution. Telling stories about people who are part of the solution to a problem makes your story more relatable. It makes the solution feel realistic and within reach, and it inspires them to take action. Another big takeaway from that campaign, from this example, is that you can't overlook stories about people who join forces to solve a problem, whether they're professionals doing a job, or donors and volunteers who underpin the financial and human resources that you depend on. In developing a storytelling strategy for your cause, think about the people who are part of the solution. Turning people's attention to the power of humanity can really level up the motivational power of your campaign. So a few years back when I was at the Rockefeller Foundation, we conducted some research on the state of storytelling in the social sector. That's how all of this really got started. We were prompted to do this after a new report at that time was released by the World Bank. Some of you might remember this report. Um, it was then popularized by the Washington Post and it discovered that barely anyone was actually reading the World Bank's reports. So nearly a third of their PDF reports had never ever been downloaded. 40% of them had been downloaded fewer than 100 times and only 13% had been downloaded more than 250 times in their lifetime. Since the World Bank's research purpose is to inform public debate and government policy, this data suggests that they might have been missing the mark. So we conducted our own research, and based on that, uh, based on getting groups of nonprofits and NGOs, government staff, for-profit companies, we identified five major pillars for creating, promoting, and sustaining storytelling organizations. Now, the first one, strategy. We found out that social impact organizations often dive into storytelling without articulating clear goals understanding the interests and motivations of their target audiences or knowing their target audiences at all, or setting up measurable objectives. The second one is capacity. Uh, in effective storytelling organizations, everybody understands why stories are important to share, what makes them compelling, and what turns that into strategic storytelling, something that underpins your organizational goals. In addition, senior managers needed to understand the importance of dedicating time, talent, and resources to strategic storytelling. Time, talent, and treasure, of course, being the three scarcest things at any nonprofit organization. And very few organizations have a dedicated storytelling team uh, or the resources to hire external consultants to consistently create compelling content for them. The third one is content. Uh, in today's competitive environment around content online, only the most compelling things get noticed and shared. Stories for so social impact must show people as active agents of change who play a central role in creating solutions to the problems that they face. So really quality content and stories should be at the heart of your engagement strategy, of your communication strategy. Uh, the fourth is platform. With a large number of tools and platforms that exist today, and even back then when we started this, social impact organizations struggle to understand which one they should use uh, in order to most effectively reach the right audience. And there's no one size fits all solution. That means that you can't be anywhere all of the time, or you can, I'm sorry, you can't be everywhere all of the time. You wanna use the right message on the right platform to reach the right audience. It's why you probably won't find a ton of AARP content on TikTok, but good luck escaping them on Facebook. And the last one is evaluation. 
organizations that evaluate accurately the impact of their storytelling can learn what's working and strengthen their storytelling. And that feeds back into the other four. Understanding how your content performs, on which platform, will inform how much time and resources you want to dedicate to creating more of it and where you'll want to promote it. So for this session, we're basically going to focus a little bit on strategy and the more so on capacity and content. The goal being that you'll walk away from today's presentation with the tools, tactics, and a few new apps or pieces of software that can help you on your storytelling journey, whether you're just beginning or you've been doing this for a little while. So the first thing I like to start with is why. Uh, and I always come back to Simon Sinek who wrote, start with why. Uh, and that's where we should start today as well. Uh, I love this quote, people don't buy what you do, they buy why you do it. And what you do simply proves what you believe. What that means is, uh, if you think about companies like Apple, for example, they don't market their messages. We sell a lot of computers, we sell a lot of phones. They have a fundamental philosophy about how computers, how design, how technology should work for you. That's why they focus so much on cameras and on privacy and how software should all be fluid and should be simple to use. That's the why they do the thing that they do and how it manifests that philosophy is they produce computers and iPhones, technology that's useful to you on a daily basis. So when you're setting your goals, communications, organizational, financial, whatever, you should always start with why. And during these kinds of uh, discussions, I try to find the least abrasive way of asking, why am I doing this? What's the point? What are we ultimately trying to get after here? Because if you can't answer why you're doing something, then it's either not worth doing or the idea hasn't been fully mapped out yet. In fact, if you wanna go a bit further, there's a method called the five whys technique, which was developed by the founder of Toyota in the 1930s and popularized later in the 1970s. And the technique essentially boils down asking why five times when a problem occurs so that you can get to the root of the problem and hopefully you find a remedy that becomes apparent. And Toyota still uses this technique today because asking why is a remarkably focusing exercise and doing so makes laying down your strategy and approach much easier because both you and your team will know why you're doing the thing that you're doing. After you've decided on the why, it's time to start looking at the rest of your strategy. First, always keep your audience top of mind. Who are you trying to reach? How do they like to be spoken to? Should your tone be buttoned up and professional or should it be a bit more casual? Is the audience moved more by statistics and numbers or by faces and names? It's also okay to have multiple audiences, but you wanna be as specific as you can so that you can boil down the right messaging and the right call to action for the right audience. Remember that the general public is never your audience. It's way too large, it's too vague, and you can't please everyone all the time. So find your community and go from there. Probably the best example of this is in fundraising, right? If you're a fundraiser, you probably don't make a lot of million dollar asks to people who have just left college and are just starting their careers because you know that they don't have that sort of money. So you really have to understand who your audience is and what's gonna motivate them to give and like what their capacity is for that sort of thing. The next thing is, you wanna weave data information to a compelling narrative. What's the big takeaway? The one thing you want people to understand or want to take action on? Once you land on this, then you can worry about the types of content you need to produce. Don't start with the content. Start with all the thinking behind what you want them to do, what's going to motivate them to get there, and then think about the content. Both for the overall message and even the individual piece of content level, I always ask when my XYZ audience sees this, what do I want them to think? How do I want them to feel? And what do I want them to do? As I mentioned before, making someone feel something is more powerful than just informing them. It motivates them to act and storytelling, this is why we talk so much about storytelling, that's the right tool to help you get more than just your straight facts and figures across. That's how you start activating those, those emotional uh, parts of the brain that will get them to move uh, and to do something. So at the strategic level, your think, feel, do might not relate to any overall campaign or your content strategy. For example, if your organization works to feed communities, uh, you might set up a storytelling campaign that wants people to think, this is an organization uh, that's effective. It's a reliable partner in the community and it feeds people in need. You might want them to feel empathy for those affected by hunger and then a sense of trust and alignment with your mission. And then for do, you want them to volunteer food, money, whatever to the cause. You want them to join you on this trip. You want them to help their fellow man and do so through you. The last thing, what does success look like? How do you know you've achieved it? 
Is it going to be the more money you've raised or the new donors that are acquired? Is it a specific thing like a thousand hungry kids have access to free lunch in the summer? Tie your goals to the messages call to action. Make your goal meaningful to you, the people that you serve and the people who you're calling on for support. Don't do goals like we're building the field of because that's not super meaningful to the people you're trying to activate, right? You need to give them something tangible to hold on to. As we said before, to make that end goal, that solution relatable and resonant within them so they feel motivated to act. So they feel that they can see themselves as part of your solution. So as you begin to set up your strategy and you start shifting to content, also consider who your storyteller should be. Should it always be your ED? Or do you want staff or volunteers or even beneficiaries to play a role? You wanna consider, does this person have credibility, authority with our target audience? Does it have the trust of the organization and of the community? Do they have all the facts? Are they capable of answering questions or addressing issues? If that's particularly important if you're going to stand them up in front of a journalist or a crowd who might ask them questions. Do you want Steve Buscemi here spearheading a youth activation campaign? Is he a credible authority with Generation Z on college life issues? Probably not. Um, and I really wanna emphasize, uh, and this might be a, a tricky subject in some organizations, your ED should not always be your spokesperson. They should not always be the storyteller. Your organization is the brand, so it's important to establish diverse voices that can carry its message. Because what happens when your ED retires? Or what if your programs move in a direction where your ED doesn't have the most, credible, or most credibility or the most authority? It shouldn't be the case that because they can't speak uh, as an established expert, uh, the expert in one area of the field, they should leave your organization. You want to make that, you want to establish some fluidity that their leadership can, can stand as the overall messaging of the institution, but you also have these experts that work in your institution uh, and can speak to the various components of why you do the thing you do, what you do to achieve your mission. So always remember to diversify your storytellers. This also helps you too uh, on the very tactical side when you're recruiting things for blog content or social media content, not always having the same name appear, spices things up, it makes it a little bit more interesting. Also makes it more interesting to the press if you have multiple people that you can position to them so it doesn't feel like they're constantly getting the same name to run. When you're doing storytelling, one of the most important things though to consider is the community norms and the ethics of storytelling, um, which for picking your storyteller might include things like, is this person giving me informed consent to use their story? or their likeness in my materials. In hearing their story, what biases and preconceptions do I need to check before I retell it? And in telling this story, is there any potential for harm against the person in the community? There are a whole list of things that we could talk about when you consider the ethics, but before, and particularly when you're telling beneficiary stories, before you do so, make sure you sit down and, and think about all the ways that what happens when you publish the story you know, what are sort of the, the follow-on effects that could impact that person. So your strategy shouldn't change very often. It's the foundation, it's the core of your storytelling, it's the overarching narrative. So now you have to think about what those stories will look, sound, or feel like. If you're regularly producing content, story bank it. If it's just a Google sheet with a list of assets and types or some folders in a Dropbox account, just story bank it. Start putting together your content inventory and it should, it should include things like photos from the field, that's a simple one, quotes from the people that you serve, videos of your work being done, or even some behind the scenes footage of the people at your organization. That's a great way to humanize your organization and the work that you do. And when you're making a video, make sure you consider how you'll plan to use it on social media. So think a little bit when you start thinking about some of the content pieces, where you would position it. Twitter, for example, caps native video uploads at two minutes and 20 seconds. So if you're planning a five minute spotlight, that's not going to work on Twitter. So you wanna make sure that you keep those sorts of things in mind. And what I found helpful is, even if I'm producing a longer video with a partner, to work with that videographer on identifying shots, stories, or clips that can be cut into 30 second bites. Then you can have your longer video as kind of your mainstay piece, position it on YouTube or Vimeo or something, and then you can take those bits and you can upload them to Instagram and Twitter and Facebook as shorter bites. And that also gives you a little bit extra mileage from your content. On the other hand, if you don't want to produce anything new or you don't have the budget, uh, figure out new ways to use the stuff that already exists. So report photos that you could use on social media for your website or just capture them to reuse later for something else. We probably all have a ton of PDFs. The PDFs weren't just copy. 
um, you can grab some photos and assets that were used to create them. You can grab the statistics and the poll quotes from those reports for tweets or Facebook image macros. Uh, and again, thinking about all the videos that organizations produce, whether it's the main video or always being sure that you get a copy of the B-roll. So again, if you're shooting that five minute video, if 10 minutes of video was captured, get it, why not? Uh, as long as you're not storing, you know, terabytes of data that you'll never use again, you might as well take it and see if you can use that B-roll for something else. What I'm saying is you need to start thinking about the types of content that we create differently because we're collecting more useful stories than we realize they're just kind of hitting the cutting room floor and we move on to the next thing because we're so busy, we don't think about all the ways it can be used. Be a little bit of a pack rat. Don't Marie Kondo your content. So, and we did the social impact story map, the narrative framework is, is kind of similar. Um, this framework helps provide structure and consistency for all of the stories your organization tells. So your story should include, uh, I'm sorry, your story should inform your audience about the problem you need. They should express why they should care about the cause. You should help them understand the solution. You should give a sense of urgency and you should also follow that up with an opportunity to act. Remember that story shouldn't just be a path to a donation page or a volunteer sign up form. Those actions are opportunities for your audience to get involved because they care about your issue. Uh, so inspire or empower them to action instead of just asking for their help. So this is actually a photo from my previous job. I'm not pictured here because this is from 1965. Uh, in 1965, there was a very different Rockefeller Foundation. We typed up very official memos on our very official typewriters, cutting edge technology back then. I think you can see a couple of them probably covered up in that photo. We released very official press releases and newsletters, and we kept official journals chronic chronicling our experiences, our progress through our work, and even the people that we interacted with. And we know all of this because all of these things we have physical records for even to this day. There's a paper trail that we can follow to learn about the foundation's history and study what the leaders were thinking at given periods of time, as well as what its impact was. Now, nearly 60 years later, we've lost something really invaluable. We don't have program staff keep journals anymore, and it's probably the same for your organization as well, at least not officially. Instead, we equip our teams with some of the most advanced storytelling equipment known to man. Smartphones have enabled us to capture our work in ways that we never thought possible. It's likely that everyone here is carrying one, but only thinks about the mail and calendar apps as the only useful work functions. The rest of it is for play, right? But the ways that we capture and share our personal lives are equally valuable uh, in the way that we can share stories from our professional lives, stories from our organization, stories about the people that we serve, the places that we've been, what we've seen and what we've done there. Mobile tech has come so far that even multi-billion dollar brands are using smartphone images in their commercials. You don't need a huge operating budget, the latest and greatest computer or a fancy DSLR camera to be an effective on the ground storyteller. And if you don't believe me, just ask Google or Apple's latest iPhone marketing campaigns. They're rightly convinced of the timeless mantra, the best camera is the one you have on you. So social and mobile have turned all of this and all of us into data orders capturing our thoughts, our feelings, our likes, our check-ins, sunsets, selfies. Like I said, we're not Marie Kondoing our, our digital lives. We save everything. And in the history of storytelling, that's something that's really incredible. It's not something that's ever been done before. So what does that mean for us? Well, first it means that we can connect to our audience uh, and to each other from anywhere in the world at any time, often from tweets and Facebook updates, blog posts and Instagram. And not only can we do it, but we do do it all the time. We share everything. We share so much that apps have been created to turn baby pictures on Facebook into bacon and cat gifs because social media in particular is the great storytelling enabler. So why not take advantage of the tools everyone's already using to collect and tell stories? So one way is to actually look at some of your staff's public postings on Twitter and Instagram. Now I really want to emphasize public postings. I don't want you to go creeping on their private Instagram accounts. So in this example from a, a few years ago, a colleague of mine was hosting a conference somewhere uh, with some grantees who were working on the ground. And while he was there, he was taking and sharing photos to an Instagram account, which I follow, which is also public. And so I said, well, uh, I messaged him and said, do you mind if we use this in some of our social media communications? You know, at some point he was gonna write a blog post about it. But in the meantime, I at least had some photos and things that I could share online. Of course he obliged. And so what that did was it gave me content from the field. It elevated a different storyteller because at that point, my colleague 
didn't have a huge public profile. He didn't contribute a lot of content. And this was an easy way for him to do that. It humanized the institution because we had a person that was attached to the work that was being done, as well as people who were in the photos that he was sharing that were doing that work. And that's, that's an important thing when you, when you start thinking about the work that we do oftentimes feels so far away, even while we're in the thick of it. And it can be hard to describe to people. Photos can go a long way to really bridging that gap. And this highlights the shift in thinking about stories. They're not just long form narratives anymore, which also means you're collecting a lot more than you probably realize or you have realized in the past. Now you probably should be thinking about all the stuff that's going on. So once you've recruited some social media and your team's personal stories as your ally, what do you do with all the content your team and partners generate? Along the way, we collect stories about the people and places we visit, the good deeds we observe, and the lives that, lives that we sustain. These stories are the powerful product of our work. I've always loved that quote because it really does, it really does underscore um, kind of the, the strategy and the tactic of storytelling because stories are timeless. The content we produced yesterday, last month, last year, decades ago, still has meaning to help shaping our lives and our narratives now. So when you're producing content, make sure that you're managing those assets as part of your staff training on collecting them, how to use them. So what I said before, story bank it. Having content at your fingertips means less time hunting for it, less time creating new stuff, less time having to ask people and hounding people to get you more stuff. Teaching people as your onboarding process uh, about how they capture, package, and send you content also means you don't have to hound them for revisions or explain to them over and over again what you're looking for. If they start thinking about what good content looks like and how it can be shared with the communications team or whichever team you're a part of that's responsible for storytelling or how they could share it themselves, it also means that they'll be proactive instead of reactive in what they create from their work. This could be as simple as someone realizing at an earlier stage that they should engage you as part of the process around a big announcement or a milestone moment or a conference or an event. It saves you a little bit of time, fewer fires to put out. So now that you have the content, you have your story bank, you're putting this stuff away, you've got some new stuff. Now the time has come to sit down and think about creating something. Stop focusing all your time and attention on the content itself. Let's think about why you're writing, who you're speaking to, where they would find that content or that article, what you want them to do. We're going to talk more about marketing and evaluation in the next session, marketing and measurement. So for now, I just wanna highlight this concept, the 40-60 rule because I think it's important to keep in mind when you're creating content too. So Garth Moore, who was formerly of the One Campaign, calls this the 40-60 rule because he thinks you should spend 40% of your time creating quality content and 60% of your time promoting it. And because time and resources are limited, it doesn't make sense to focus on volume. It's more important that you find the right audience for your content than producing the most of it. So as much as we love to talk about big numbers, if your blog post or your report only reaches five people, if they happen to be the right five people, then you've succeeded. So in this example, I think of, if you haven't watched the Netflix documentary yet, Bill's Brain, Nick Kristoff says right off the bat that the reason why, and, and Bill and Melinda Gates admit this as well, they started thinking about uh, sanitation and hygiene is because of his article in the New York Times. And he said, and I quote, this is the most important article of my career. I mean, because of that one article, it went in front of two people. Billions of dollars were steered into improving water access, sanitation, and hygiene uh, for billions of people. So remember that perfect is the enemy of good. Instead of spending all of your time creating the most viral video ever created, start thinking about why you're creating the content, who do you want to see it, what do you want them to do with it, and where should it go? Which brings us to platforms. Another key component for effective storytelling is the platform, where you're actually going to use it. Often when we produce something like a report, our first instinct is to throw it up on the website and unleash it on the world. Except the world doesn't often come to your website to download your report as the World Bank has discovered for us. And yet we still do it anyway. And there's a ton of valuable information locked inside of those PDFs. That's why you invested in them. That's why you spent time doing them. So we have to be creative about how we unleash them, how we unleash all that content. So think about where your target audience likes to hang out. As much as you'd like it to be, it's probably not on your donation page. Think about which platforms will make your content pop. How will people interact with it? Most of the time, most of you will have access to your website, to your blog, or to your social media channels, whether they're your own or, or your, your institutions. Your email, uh, and when I say email, I don't just mean your Outlook account, but also your institution's big email list, or really anything that's print, 
present at events or you pass out or send direct mail. Those are all the avenues for engagement just off the top of my head. And we just need to uh, deploy them at the right time to the right audience to make it work for you. So let's walk, let's walk through this a little bit considering the 40-60 rule, how you can use and reuse your content. So start by breaking it down into pieces. What are all the different pieces that went into creating this report that I mentioned? Tons of photos and diagrams. We have some quotes and some statistics. We have some individual stories and interviews that frame the problem and who's working on it and the solution. How could these pieces be extracted and become useful on their own? For example, among the many ways I take PDF reports apart from my clients, I also upload a copy of the report to SlideShare, which then helps me disseminate it to the world, helps me make it mobile friendly when we embed it on the site. And it's dynamic across platforms and readable on social media. Plus, because they take care of some of the marketing for me, because they suggest it to other people who are looking at similar reports, I can take a step back and focus on continuing to splice down this report to start putting you know, the stories on the blog and social media and things like that. The next thing, uh, in this example, I actually did this with a report a few years back now at this point. Uh, it was called an insights publication. Essentially, it was a narrative style research project about pressing issues in food security, domestic poverty, climate change, other topics, other heavy media topics. And it was published as a physical magazine and a PDF. But instead of uploading the PDF to the site, I broke down each section, uh, each, each area around food, domestic poverty, et cetera, into their own individual blog posts and then I added that slide share of the full report to each of the posts. So it turned this single report into about eight different blog posts, which we promoted over weeks to different, more specific audiences. So I would obviously promote the food security pieces to people who cared most about food security and not you know, the domestic poverty piece, even though those things are related. Really finding the thing people are interested in and being able to serve it to them because we broke this apart. I also pulled out images and quotes and statistics, and I used them to create social media content, those social media macros that you've seen before that are just a light background or a frame and have a pull quote or something like that associated with them. Each of those pieces led to a place you could download the full publication, so everybody was happy there. But more people were consuming the shorter content than were downloading the report. And this just created a bunch of different avenues into disseminating that information instead of burying it on our website. All right, email is often the forgotten channel for engagement. Typically, when organizations send an email, we rarely ask the people to share or do something when they receive the message. So in this example, when a new program was launched, the organization posted an image of the announcement on Facebook and Twitter, just a simple graphic about the, uh, about the launch of the thing. So instead of emailing the press release to the master list of people who had signed up, we added pre-populated share links to our e-blast and asked recipients to share that on Facebook and Twitter, which linked back to more information about the program and to the website. I purposely kept the barrier to participation very low. I wanted the amount of information explicitly shared to be kept to the necessary and to the, and to the digestible. When the email recipient shared the macro, we were able to amplify that message through their networks. They didn't have to do anything but press one of the two buttons at the top there. Now I wanna give, let me see if I can get this to work. Uh, this is a really great example of something a little bit more recent, right? So, um, I want to take one final example on how the Vietnamese government brought most of the content creation com components together that we just talked about, from thinking about what the message they wanted to convey towards that goal, who they're trying to reach, where and how they would reach them, and when they would ask them, what they would ask them to do next. So as we've discussed, story, stories are meant to convey information in an understandable and memorable way. Videos and songs are probably among the most memorable ways to do that. So in this example, let's see how the Vietnamese government took a simple concept, hand washing and basic hygiene, and made it relevant, memorable, and catchy. And then they added a social component to help them spread the message. Oliver prepared to 
Um, oops, went too far there. So if you watch the full three minute video, you'll see how they tell the story of a young couple who are fighting for some reason, they don't really go into that. And then they get drawn into a news report about the coronavirus. They join, they join forces to combat the disease by washing their hands, pumping iron, which we saw, cleaning the house. And if you take your social impact story map to this frame, you can quickly match all the facets listed there to the video. But most impressive is how quickly and effectively the message had spread. And you can see that from this clip, because this is from an American news outlet covering it, covering another American news outlet covering it. And I actually pulled this video from the CDC's YouTube page. And that's an interesting component in and of itself, because essentially they created several entry points into a kernel of a story. First, their three minute video about the couple fighting the coronavirus. So you had your own story watching the entire video. Second, the song itself, which is remarkably catchy and provides very clear instructions on what they want people to do. Third, the TikTok dance challenge, which helped facilitate the spread of their song and their message. People were participating in the actions, activated crowds of people to listen to the message, become active storytellers themselves. All of this just to tell people, wash your hands, keep, surface, keep surfaces clean, and maintain a healthy lifestyle. So things you can do right now. Um, Keeping a few of these things in mind, you could start by asking your team for some sort of content when they head out into the field. Bring back one quote, one photo, one video of what's going on or people being helped. Make sure you get releases, though, if you're going to use photos or videos of people, just as an aside. Um, make the barrier to entry very low, even for your own team. Start building your story bank. Things you can go back to later for use on your site, for stories you can share during interviews, speeches, or blog posts. Stay current on what's going on in the digital space, all the new tools and fun things like that. I try to focus on reports and articles published on sites like MNR, N10, CauseVox, which has a great learning section, the Communications Network, HubSpot, and many more. And don't forget to reuse your old content. Throwback Thursday is a great reminder to throw back, don't throw away your content. Take a look back through your analytics, see what could be reused on other media, or could be spruced up or refreshed. Not everything you've used before is dated, or deserves to be buried on your website. Remember that social media is not just a fire and forget tool. Tools you can use right now, the communications network now manages all of the tools and resources that were once housed under a digital storytelling platform called Hatch for Good. It's now called Storytelling for Good. And they're updating all of the case studies, how-to guides, articles, and more. Much of the content that I presented today was adapted from materials and research that went into creating that platform, which I was a program officer for, which is how I actually got started on this whole, whole journey. Um, but the communications network in general is a phenomenal resource. You're probably most familiar with Google Photos as a consumer side app that backs up and stores your photos for free. But there's also a commercial side. So if you're a G Suite user, you can have a Google Photos app for your brand. And Google is well known for their image recognition technology that automatically inserts the metadata into your photos that makes it easier for you to find things. So that's the reason why when you type in dog, sunset, food, Google can help resurface those photos for you because it's, it's applying a machine learning layer to each of your images. And you can, you can use that in absence of an, in absence of an enterprise level uh, digital asset manager, a dam. So your, your G Suite user uh, administrator would need to turn on the photos for you and your team. But once it's on and you're added as a manager, you'll be able to upload and sort all your photos and videos there. Uh, one caveat on Google before I move on is that they do ha have an upload limit, so they will resize some of your photos if they're very high quality. So just keep that in mind. Uh, in that event, if you have really high quality stuff, I forget what the cap is, though they're very explicit about it. It's mostly for DSLRs and high-end video cameras. You know, upload them to um, a paid version of Google Drive or Dropbox or something like that. The next thing is Google Forms and surveys can be really useful tools for collecting stories in a pinch. For example, if your organization uses volunteers for regular or special events, ask your volunteers to fill out a quick survey about why they volunteer with you, what their experience has been, and that really gives that you an opportunity to kind of spotlight the work that's going on on the ground and elevate them as well and make them feel rewarded. And since Google Forms feeds into Google Sheets, you'll start collecting a database of quotes that you can use later on when you need a quote for an email or a brochure or even for social media. It gives you the opportunity to make follow-ups of volunteers a bit more personal. 
Uh, if you're not familiar with Canva, it's a quick and easy graphic design photo editing tool. What's particularly nice about it is it has a fairly robust free tier, and it's also remarkably intuitive, particularly if you don't like Photoshop. This is a great alternative. If you don't need the full Photoshop suite and you, know, you need to edit some videos or edit some photos, excuse me. The other ben uh, benefit is that Canva is free if you're a registered 501c3. Uh, so if you check out the link, I believe I've added it there. Um, I did not, I will send it to you. <laughs> um, there is a free tier. All you have to do is, say, uh, is show them your 501c3 uh, determination letter and they'll invite you and I think it's nine other people into a premium account for free. And the last one is Grammarly, which I live and die by. You've probably seen some ads for this as well. It's a writing and editing tool that can help you save hours of time writing and editing posts. If you, uh, it's web-based software, so you don't need to download anything. It automatically reviews your writing and offers suggestions to improve things like grammar, clarity, spelling, and more. It has extensions for Chrome and Google Docs, as well as for Microsoft Office. And it's certainly been a lifesaver for me because it can often take the first pass through a post to pick out some of the things that I would get, but would need to take a few minutes to find myself. I highly recommend checking out the free version. And if you write a lot, it's probably worth checking out the premium tier as well. And that's all I have. So at this point, I would open it up for any questions. Thanks so much, Jeremy. So if you have any questions, feel free to chat it in or put it in the QA box um on the zoom we have about let's say eight to ten minutes left for questions um one of the questions related to storytelling is jeremy you presented some different frameworks that people can use like the narrative framework uh for example like what's the best way for the participants today to use that framework uh, with their teams um in order to craft a story yeah i so i think about the social impact story map on the very high level um, because it gives you kind of the it gives you the underpinnings of where you want to go with your communication strategy right really framing the problem that you're trying to solve who's involved in solving it what the solution is and what those call to action should be what that call to action should be i find that one most easy to understand and to present to people um, the narrative framework is obviously still very simple as well, but when I think about that, I think about how I use that for actually writing content, like longer form things, maybe it's your annual report, maybe it's a blog post itself, less so about shorter things like social media posts. Great. We have a question coming in uh, from Heather asking about if you can give more information on why uh, you should use SlideShare for promoting your report. This might be for an annual report. This is so, I use SlideShare for any PDFs or things like that. And I do so, um, <laughs> well, for a variety of reasons. First and foremost, some of the sites that I've worked on in the past were not um, mobile friendly. Less so now, obviously, because we're in 2020, but sometimes websites aren't super mobile friendly. SlideShare can mobile optimize reports. So as I was saying before, I could share a report on social media if you were just, you wanted to share a PDF. SlideShare would take care of that for you when it went out in a tweet, right? The second thing is um, a lot of these platforms, because they have a vested interest in people coming back and using their platform, they help market it for you. So if I'm on SlideShare viewing one report that's similar to the one you uploaded and in includes some of the same tags and things that you've used before, I will get served that and say, hey, you should check out this report. Um, and so yeah. that, that's kind of an, another reason why. Great. No question coming in from Sarah. So any rec recommendations for quick and easy conversion of images from high resolution to like a smaller resolution? I you know, are, Jeremy, you mentioned Canva before, but Jeremy, do you have any other recommendations? I do. In fact, it's, it's on my next class slides. I'm going to repeat it when we get to it. But I will tell you, it's an it's a, it's a app called Squish. Um, it's a web-based app. And it does exactly what the name suggests. It's free to use. You upload an image and it squishes it for you. Um, and by quite a bit, I often use it to take, uh, one of my clients is a robotics uh, nonprofit and they'll have drone photography, which is huge. And in order to get it on the website, I have to use that to pare it down. Great. Uh, moving on. So Stephanie's asking, how do you help your organization begin to move away from just the ED, the executive director being the primary storyteller 
and actually instilling a, more of a culture of storytelling across your organization? Yeah, you know, the, the answer you hear from everybody is it starts at the top. I think that's mostly true. I think you mostly do need to have buy-in from the top, but getting buy-in from the top is absolutely worthless if you, if you don't have the top person helping to push that along, right? So how I think about it is I need buy-in from the top. I need that person to, to understand that this is important and why it's important, but then I need to find somebody who's at a lower level, either a peer or like one step above, who's gonna become kind of an ambassador or champion of that cause. And they're gonna be the person that, they'll be the one that starts tweeting from their personal account about work stuff because they want to become their own kind of brand and you help promote it, right? Or they're the ones that are going to take the initiative and say, I'm going to draft the blog post and we're going to put my name on it. And you kind of start there. Once other colleagues see that sort of, um, sort of stuff happening, they tend to start following along, particularly when they're not getting in trouble. If that person got yelled at when they submitted the stuff, that's where you need that buy-in from the top that's not gonna get you very far. So there's a, me there's a mechanism of culture change, but there's also finding the right ambassadors at, at the right level who can actually give you the thing that you need. Uh, let me see. I think that's a great answer. I, you know, it's, it's like a lot of culture change is quite difficult. Um, I, I think it's one of the ways that's easy for to present it is, especially if the uh, there's a lot of centralization of power is just to do more of a pilot storytelling program where you can empower folks at a smaller scale to do something and then that will socialize it across the decision makers to make it a little bit easier to uh, release some of that authority from their hands. A uh, question that we have from Nara is can you share some organizations that you think do a great job with storytelling? So any campaigns that you liked or any clients that you worked with that uh, you think do a good job storytelling? I mean, everybody always points to, and this is true, everybody always points to Charity Water as a great example. Um, they point to them because they do have just phenomenal uh, images and, and things of that nature. I also understand, I always issue this as a caveat, they have a pretty healthy budget dedicated to this. Um, so you have to kind of take that and say, okay, here are some things that we could maybe emulate on a lighter budget, a smaller budget. Maybe you don't have professional photographers in the field, but some of the essence of what they're sharing is, is something that you can mimic. Uh, I work with a great organization called We Robotics, uh, which again is that uh, robotics nonprofit. They focus on using drones, teaching people in the developing world and in the global South, how to use robotics and AI to solve problems. And, um, you know, not all the stories that they surface are 100% perfect, right? Because this is not, this is not something that everybody's doing, but it is actually a culture that they've instilled um, in the organization itself where people do contribute and they get quite a bit of content and some of it's great and some of it needs some work, but at the end of the day, it's great that they've actually made the effort and they've made this part of their culture and they're constantly getting better at it. Awesome. And we have, Probably have time for maybe one or two more questions. So let's see, do you have any, where are we? Uh, what resources do you recommend to look at? Uh, like the MNR research, was that one of them? Yeah. Okay. Any other resources that you recommend? Uh, I, I left a list on there. I can go back to it if it's helpful, maybe. Yeah, um, oh, that's too far. Okay, it's somewhere on the slide deck. Anyway, um, N10, uh, which does a lot on technology capacity building inside organizations, but technology covers everything. So there's a ton of great stuff on marketing communications and storytelling. Causevox obviously has a, a phenomenal site. I use a, a HubSpot a lot, which is a, a CRM company, but they do a lot on marketing communications. Um, Ad Espresso, uh, uh, there's there's a whole a whole list of them. I, I know I put some extras in the slides that I, I might have forgotten and the communications network, obviously. Mm -hmm. And we'll have the slides shared with you within about um, 12 hours or so. So you'll see that either later today or early tomorrow. Great. So one last question from Sarah is, how can you figure out who your target audience is? And that's an institutional question. So who your target audience is should be the question of, you know, who are the people that you're serving? Who are the people that are most interested in helping those people? Um, I work for an organization that works on providing bikes uh, in 
areas around the world as a mechanism of transportation, but really for livelihood, getting education, that sort of thing. Um, and so like their target audience, if they're looking for donors uh, in the US are often people who ride bikes. And it's not that hard of a sell to convince somebody who uses a bike to commute the value of a bike in commuting and why they should give you know, to donate to another. So you really have to distill that down at your organizational level. Who are you trying to motivate to give and why? What's their incentive for giving? Why do they feel attached to the cause? Awesome. Well, Jeremy, I think that's all the time we have for this class. Uh, so the next class will be class number two, uh, which is next Tuesday on March 17th at 3 p.m. You will get an email um, related to the Zoom link that you should use for that webinar very soon. Um, within the next 12 hours or so, we will be sending out an email summary of um, with links to the recording as well as the slides so you all can find those links to those resources uh, that Jeremy put in some of the slides. Um, in the meantime, if you have any questions, feel free to reach out. We'll be happy to help and we're excited to continue our journey on digital storytelling. Uh, very lastly, uh, Jeremy did put together a, a template for you to use for your content creation. Um, I will include this in the summary email that you'll get uh, by tomorrow. So feel free to take a look at that. This is a PDF resource, resource that guides you through um, some valuable steps on creating your content for blog posts. So really powerful. Well, thanks so much, Jeremy, for your time and for, your, for the attendees. Thank you so much for joining us today. All right, thanks everybody.